So I guess I'll start. Um, I just wanted to thank Lisa, Libby, and Gage for you guys taking the time out of your schedules. I know it's kind of busy um, to do this for Basketball Saskatchewan. I'm NAV. Um, basically, what's going to happen now is Lisa is going to get it's going to be question for about I would say about 30, 35 minutes um, with two with two players that are going to be playing at U of S next year. Libby, who is currently one of um, is playing for the Huskies and Gage who is playing at Carleton and congrats on your all-star, your all-star nod um, Gage, by the way. Thank you. Um, and I, I found out recently that um, Libby, you actually, you actually played for basketball Saskatchewan for four years, five years. Okay. Okay. So I will leave it to you guys. Um, and Lisa and coach Lisa, you can answer and do what you do. And say pass on the ones I don't want to answer. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Lib, I think you're muted. <laughs> Am I here? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll start. Okay. Okay, coach, why did you decide to become a coach? Great question. Um, I think a number of different things. Um, I think probably the most impactful part of that decision was I had an awesome coach in university. Actually, I had a couple different coaches in university and um, I had one, one coach for my first two years. And honestly, after my second year, I thought I was going to stop playing basketball. I thought that I was done. That, you know, I didn't really have much motivation. And then uh, Teresa was hired at McMaster and, and she came onto the scene and um, she had just a huge impact on me and, and on my career and really sparked something in me to, to really motivate me to want to be the best I could be. And so I realized, you know, after playing three more years and having such a great uh, influential person in my life and in my, especially my, my basketball life, but also um, the rest of my life, um, I really realized what a good coach can do and how impactful they can be on young women's lives. And so that really stuck with me. Um, and then I went on to play professional for a couple of years and I had a, basically a career ending injury and I had been coaching, you know, throughout the course of my university career and um, with provincial teams and stuff in the summer. And so I always had an interest in it. And when I played pro, I started to think, um, you know, maybe I would be a better coach than a player. I started to really think the game and, and try to understand the game on a different level. And I wasn't, um, I wasn't an athlete that was going to overpower you. Um, I was much more um, wanting to outsmart you. And so that really got my interest in, on that side of the game, on the coaching front. And, um, you know, one thing led to the next and I got an opportunity here at Sask, but it was really kind of lucky how I, how I landed into that position. But that, all those things really led me to, down this path. Sweet. Okay. I'll ask a couple and then Gage will ask a couple. Perfect. So what personality traits do you think make you a good coach? Maybe I should ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Uh, I mean, that's a hard one because I think there can be so many different personality traits and different people and different coaches that um, can lead them to be a good coach. I mean, I think the most important thing is probably you have to be true to yourself and you can't be something that you're not and that isn't innately in your personality. I think um, so many young coaches and even, you know, I, I fell victim to this early on is you read a lot of coaching books and you hear about a lot of great coaches and you try to be like them. And, um, you know, especially when I first got into coaching, a lot of the more prominent coaches were men and a lot of them had very fiery personalities were yellers and screamers and that really wasn't part of my personality and so I think you know you have to find your way you have to be true to yourself and be authentic and um, you know be a leader in whatever way you know how and and that will hopefully um, again lead to success and lead you to being a good leader and hopefully a good coach along the way. I know for myself um, I think I'm pretty analytical in terms of my understanding of the game and um, in terms of my personality, I'm very introverted. So I'm probably, um, there aren't many coaches that would be introverted and not type A. And uh, so it's very unique for me, I think. Um, 
So I'm definitely a little more quiet and um, introspective and like to relate to the players a, a bit differently than the typical coach. Sweet. Okay, one more. At what age did you start playing basketball and what made you start? Um, probably started, you know, in elementary school, but nothing organized. My brother and I would shoot around in our backyard. We had a backboard and a hoop nailed to the back of our garage. And we had like a, um, we had patio stones in the back. So you'd never have a true bounce on the dribble. <laughs> we played a ton of like 21, a ton of horse. Um, yeah, just played against each other in the backyard. And I think grade seven was probably the first time I played for a team. Um, and that, you know, I loved the game and it just kind of grew and grew as I, as I got older and got to play with more like-minded people and good athletes. And, and again, for amazing coaches that really lit the fire for me. Okay, my turn. <laughs> um, when did you fall in love with the game of basketball? Um, I would have to say, I always really liked it. Um, I'd have to say it was, it would be during university when the coaching change happened and I started to really believe in myself and, and think that, wow, I, you know, I might be okay at this. I could probably, if I really invested into this and really gave it everything I had, I might be able to be pretty good. And, um, you know, it's funny how that happens when you actually give it your all, how much you get back from it. And, and really that was the case for me. And it really sparked me on to do that even more and more. And I really got, um, I don't want to say addicted, but uh, it was something that, you know, you worked harder, so you got to see success and you saw success, so it made you want to work harder and then you had more success. And so you want, so it just like was that cyclical um, process, I guess. And uh, so for me, it was, it was during that time for sure. Nice. If you weren't a coach, what would you be doing? That's a tough one. because <laughs> I have no idea what I would be doing if I wasn't coaching. Um, I often thought of either going into med school. I really love animals, so I also thought about being a veterinarian. Mm. Um, I also like cooking and I like food, but I, I, I'm not good enough to do that. So I, I think maybe a doctor or a vet. Oh, nice. <laughs> what is one thing you would say is different from when you played? Um, the players are way better. Uh, way more skilled and um, everything is just like on another level you know everyone's bigger faster stronger more skilled um, I think the game's really taken off you know and and women in Canada and um, basketball's become big and popular and young women pick it up now and take it seriously and so I'd say just the game and the players that play it have really progressed I would say um, Probably the game was a bit more physical then. I don't know if you're watching like The Last Dance, but um, they were talking about basketball in the 80s. It was like super physical in the NBA, and that, that was right in my wheelhouse. Like I was in high school in the 80s and um, university in the 90s, and I'd say, yeah, it was super physical. I'd say the athletes are different. Oh, I think that might be the next question about how they've changed over the course of my career here. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it to the next question. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of touching on it. Okay. How have players changed from when you first started coaching? Do you find they are more coachable or less? Um, any examples? What do you like now and what do you like from earlier oh. years? Okay. Um, I'd say when I first started coaching, uh, players just did what you asked them to do. Unquestionable. Um, they didn't question anything. It was like, they were sponges. They did what you asked. It was like jump and they would say how high it wasn't like how many times, <laughs> why do I have to do this? Um, so probably a little bit of that. They probably didn't have as much of an understanding for the game, but had amazing work ethic and there were no parents ever involved. It was just like players showed up, they worked their tails off. Um, they came back and there was no, there didn't seem to be complaining or questioning. Um, but I'd also say they didn't have as deep of an understanding about the game. I'd say right now players are more skilled for sure. Um, I'd say the important thing is you really have to explain to athletes the why behind what you're doing. I think um, 
again, there's a greater understanding. There's more opportunities for, for student athletes now. So they've been coached by a lot of different people. They might have learned the game a different way. And so if you don't understand or you don't explain the why, I think you're leaving yourself open to um, athletes that might question what you're doing. Um, I'd say the impact of parents on student athletes is way bigger than it has ever been. Um, just as far as like, choosing schools, where to go to for their post-secondary career, um, having say in terms and opinion around playing time and things like that. I think that's really prevalent in high schools, not so much in, at university, but um, I think just parents are playing a much bigger and active role in, in their child's boarding lives. So yeah, I think that's, oh, players didn't have scholarships back in the day. So they were literally doing it for the love of the game. Like it, we worked so hard and had nothing that you know you really had players that loved it because otherwise why would you do it whereas now i think sometimes i think players because they're good and they they get scholarships it's seen as a little bit more of a job potentially um or a means to an end you know i'm going to get this money because i'm going to play basketball but do i really love it or is it just something that i've done for so long and i'm good at it so i might as well but aren't really willing to put in the extra time and and really eat, sleep, and breathe the game like I think a lot of other players did in the past. Sweet. Okay, kind of similar. What type of player do you like to coach or watch and why? Okay. Um, I love to coach hardworking, humble, um, team-first players, really. Um, I remember when I first started at U of S, we were terrible. Um, and, and some of the athletes that would come would be, you know, barely making provincial teams. And at the end of their three, four five years, they were beating a lot of teams that were way more skilled or had players that had much bigger profiles than they did. And I love seeing that improvement and development in, in those athletes and our team. So, um, I love working with athletes who want to work hard and who want to get better, who have a sincere desire to be coached and um, are in it for the betterment of the team, you know, are willing to do whatever it takes. So, I mean, Libby, you're such a great example of this, um, you know, willing to forego individual accolades because for the betterment of the team, you have to play a certain role or, you know, you get so much joy out of creating an awesome assist as opposed to scoring the two. So I love players like that. Um, and again, just the hard work. I think that's just, that's, that's us, that's Saskatchewan. I think the hard work is just in us. And I think, um, you know, when people watch us play, they, they love to see that kind of attitude and, and that kind of identity in a player and a team. So, um, yeah. Nice. What is your favorite part of the game to coach? Hmm. I'd say there's probably two answers. One is I love trying to figure out game plan to ha in terms of how to beat another team to, to determine what their weaknesses are and how we can exploit them and also how to negate their strengths. So that part, I really like the strategy around that and trying to figure out like little tricks and little things that might make a big difference on the scoreboard. But I also love, love, love the just day to day being in the gym with with student athletes who want to be there and who want to work and who want to compete and who want to get better. So yeah, there's definitely like the, the strategy side I like, but then there's the very like human element and personal side that, that you get so much, um, I guess so much reward from. Yeah, it's tons of fun. Oh. Um, you kind of touched on this before, but what do you love coaching most about most in basketball? Like the people, the strategy development, like seeing players grow? Yeah, definitely the seeing how good players can be, how, how good they can become. And especially when you work with driven student athletes who want to be great and you get to watch their progress and help them, um, help them succeed and help them get better. I think that's the most rewarding part of coaching. Um, just seeing them grow as individuals and into amazing young women. I think, you know, we're super privileged in, in these positions to, to, to get to witness that and to get to assist in, in players development sweet um what do you look for in players that you're actively recruiting um 
get this question a lot and there definitely has to be like a base of athleticism and skill that has to be there. Like there's no question. Um, but once that's there, uh, definitely a toughness, um, a mental toughness, a physical toughness. I think, you know, you're going to step into an environment that's elite and that's going to be a lot of work and it's going to be hard. And if you don't have that mental or physical toughness, people are going to break down. They're not going to, they're not going to thrive in, in our environment. Um, they have to have an absolutely deep desire to be coached and to want to get better. And um, again, no matter how good an athlete is when they come out of grade 12 or whatever it may be, it's never going to be good enough to impact at a youth sport level. You have to be coachable and you have to want to work and you have to want to get better. Um, and then I guess the third one would be, have to be a great teammate. Um, so, you know, how do, how do people behave when they're on the court? What do they do when things don't go their way? Um, how do they react when officials make a call that maybe they don't agree with? How do they react when they get subbed off? So I think those are really important things too, to, to me and to, to our program. Um, yeah, the toughness, definitely the character piece, the, um, the coachability, and, and then, like I said, the, the teammate part. Nice. Okay. What is one, yes, what is one piece of advice that you would pass along to all young male or female basketball players in Saskatchewan? Um, I think it would, it would revolve around um, just believing in themselves and how good they can be. I think, I think when, when you're in Saskatchewan or you live in Saskatchewan, it's so easy to have an underdog mentality. And part of that can be really advantageous because I think it really spurs you on to work harder. Um, but it's, it can be detrimental if you have any sort of like inferiority complex where you're, you're thinking, oh, just because I'm from Sask doesn't mean I can be a great basketball player. Or those people from Ontario have so many more opportunities. Or if you're in BC and they have so many AEU teams and club teams, you get to travel to the States. Like it's not about all that. Um, I think, again, being from this province, we have such a unique advantage in that a strong work ethic really is bred into us. And um, that can take people so much further than, than talent a lot of times. And uh, we have to leverage that for sure. And I think we have to believe that we can be great basketball players in Sask. And I think the success of our teams here um, on, the, on the national stage really speaks to that. And um, you know, at nationals performing really well with our provincial teams and our university teams always being ranked in the top 10. I think that says a lot. And um, so, yeah, I think just having that confidence that, that we can ball out here. <laughs> nice. Okay. I probably should be able to list these, but what is your <laughs> coaching philosophy in three words? <laughs> um, I might throw a curveball at you then. Um, okay. I think it would be, uh, to sum it up, helping student athletes succeed. <laughs> okay, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go. You can go one of two ways. You can like list three things that would be super important. But I think for me, I think it boils down to that, um, like me helping student athletes achieve their potential, succeed in all areas of their life. So on the basketball court, in the classroom. Um, and preparing them for, for life after university. So whether that be in the community or um, with alumni, whatever that may be. But I think that's, you know, when you coach at the university level, I think that, that really has to be it. You have to think about the whole person and not just the basketball player. And um, again, what's going to happen with that player after, in terms of life after basketball and, and helping them best prepare for success, whatever that may look like. Nice. What does your preparation look like the week before playing a team? What do the coaches do? What do the players do? Woo. Okay. Well, the coaches watch a whole lot of film. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so it probably starts like two weeks before we play an opponent. Coaches will start watching film and, and start clipping things. Um, so our Monday, if we had played the Friday, Saturday prior, um, Sunday would be our day off. Monday, if we were home, we would um, 
likely just do an hour shoot and about a 45 minute lift. So that would be Monday. Uh, Tuesday, we might watch a little bit of film. No, that's probably too early. Tuesday, we wouldn't. Tuesday would be mostly focused on us. Tuesday is usually our harder day. Get in some fitness. We're going full court up and down, some transition stuff. Probably in some breakdowns, we sneak in some actions that our opponent might do that we know we're going to have to prepare for. So we try to get a few things in there without the athletes knowing that that's something that our opponent is doing. It's just a bit of a breakdown. We're working on uh, some defensive adjustments there. And then Wednesday, we may watch a little bit of film before practice just to give our, our team a bit of a visual of what to expect. Um, we'll have scrimmage guys come in and they'll mimic what the opponent's going to do. So the, we'll use them in breakdown. We'll use them in full court. Um, Tuesday would be like a two-hour practice. Wednesday would probably be close to a two-hour practice. And then Thursday would be an hour and a bit practice, depending on how things go. Um, Thursday, shorter, um, more intense, lots of five on five, lots of shooting. Um, guys will come in for half an hour of kind of preparing for the opponent. And that's about it. And then Friday, we would have an hour shoot and then we play Friday night and then kind of the same sort of thing on Saturday, a shoot and some film and, and play Saturday night. So, and also in there would be an, another lift. So they would lift Monday and then they'd also lift Wednesday. So it's, it's pretty intense and then throw in the full course load along with that and and it's um it's quite a commitment that the, the student athletes have to make but it'll definitely be worth it <laughs> <laughs> definitely worth it um does your team have any other goals in the season other than winning a championship hmm. i would say um not really tangible goals hey lib like we don't really talk about that kind of stuff we're really we really focus on, on process and, you know, certain things along the way, whether it be um, around communication, whether it be around connection or cohesion, um, you know, being a good teammate, um, whatever it may be. But honestly, we don't, we don't talk a lot about the end game at all. And even at the beginning of the season, you know, it might get referred to or alluded to as far as what the ultimate goal is. Um, but we don't really talk about that even along the way. It's, it's more just, it's about us being the best version of ourselves each day and getting a little bit better each and every day so that at the end, um, we'll be ready for anything. And I think that's been a really good part and, and part of our process and our journey along the way is that we don't talk about that stuff. It's really just about us and it's not about any one thing or anyone, anyone else. It's really just, it all comes down to us and, and being able to play our best and be our best. I don't know, would you add anything about that, Lib? Um, no, I guess just from a player side, like we set goals, say one individual a week or two individuals a week or a certain amount of shots that we kind of hold ourselves to. Yeah. But I think anyone in our program just has that knowledge of we want to be the fittest, we want to be the, the best, and it's not so much like flaunted or like up in lights kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, well said. Nice. Okay, this is my last question, but Great. what is different in your opinion that helped this year's team win the national title that other teams lacked? Mm. Um, well, honestly, we probably had, um, we had a lot of talent, like we're not gonna, deny that obvious fact mm -hmm. um i think one of the biggest advantages we had is or and we have um is the experience at nationals and being in big games and i think there were so many games you know towards the end of the season where it really showed that we had been in these situations many times before um probably our the best example was the semi-final in ken west championship semi-final with ken west and, and we were down um most of the second half or all the second half until what was it 40 seconds left in the game lib and yeah. they drove and kicked out and we hit a three to put us up one and uh, we were literally 40 seconds away from losing in the can west semi mm -hmm. and that huge three was was the difference maker and got us through the can west final and that was a close game too but uh we just i think we just um 
we had a lot of mental toughness. We didn't have people who caved. We didn't have people who shied away from taking or taking the big shot or making the big play. Um, we weren't afraid to make mistakes. It was more like we knew that we could, we had to go out there and get it. You know, you've, you've heard the phrase that you can't play afraid to lose. You got to go out and play to win. And I think our team did that. I think we also had um, the advantage of coming off a very disappointing finish last year. So that disappointment, I think really fueled the fire for this team this year. Um, we knew last year we had enough talent to probably win it all, but we didn't play our best. And so this year it just really seemed like nothing was going to stop this, this group. They laid it all out um, every time. And, um, you know, it really, I thought really looked like they were on a mission and, um, you know, did an amazing job, especially uh, at nationals, you know, we, Took care of every team pretty pretty handily so it was uh it was fun to watch and be a part of it was okay last question <laughs> coming off an incredible season and bringing home a national championship what are you looking forward to next year in the incoming freshman class hmm. i think um we have done this once before and, and libby was part of an incoming class that after we just won national championship so it was interesting because we graduated and we lost, I think, five of those players after we won nationals. And um, so we had a great recruiting class and they were coming in. But of course, after you win nationals and you lose that many key players, expectations are not as high. And you just kind of go in thinking, you know, I wonder what we can do with these young ones and, and just see how they can respond. And amazingly enough, uh, we ended up winning Canvas Championship that following year. And so I think for this year going in, not that we expect to win a Canvas Championship, but um, you really recalibrate and you get excited about what this team is going to look like next year. Because again, we're going to lose some big pieces. We're going to return a lot of big pieces. And then we have some some good players coming in. So you really get excited about, okay, what's, what's the 2021 version of the Huskies going to look like? How are we going to play differently? How are we still going to see success and ensure success by playing maybe a, a bit of a different way or not relying on the same people as much? So to me, it's, it's always really exciting because it's, it's a new journey. It's a new goal. It's a, it's a very different, potentially very different environment. and. Um, it's a new challenge. So, yeah, it's one that, that I really look forward to. Um, on behalf of Basketball Saskatchewan, we just want to thank you three ladies for taking the time to do this. Um, it was fun. It was good. And I learned a lot. So thank awesome. you guys. All the yeah, best. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you.